Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The great test of Abraham, our father in faith, was to take his only son by Sarah up the mountain called Moriah, alone, and sacrifice him upon an altar. The boy Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice upon his back up the mountain. He allowed himself to be bound upon the wood by his father, Abraham. Just as Abraham was about to bring down the knife upon the beloved son, an angel stopped him and God provided a ram stuck in a tree. This event, this truly historical event acts as a type that has many things to teach us. But today, let's focus on the priesthood. A priest is one who makes sacrifice to God. Priesthood has come under serious attack, and it seems as if the devil is working at cashing in his chips, trying to win in the great gamble he made with God to destroy his church in a new hundred years war. From all that has been happening over the last few decades, especially, it appears the devil has his army in strategic locations. He has scandals to uncover. He is having some success with even cardinals being defrocked and laicized or imprisoned. Thus, it behooves us to reflect again upon the necessity of the priesthood and its deep, nay, even cosmic significance, cosmic connections to that Friday made good by his majesty, the high priest, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To do this effectively, let's reflect upon how the priesthood of Christ as being the order of Melchizedek, as the sacred scriptures explain, this order of the priesthood has been established from the foundation of the world. St. Paul in his letter to the Hebrews says, which we have as an anchor of the soul, sure and firm, and which entereth in even within the veil, where the forerunner, Jesus, is entered for us, made a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews. It used to be that they tied a rope to the high priest of old when he entered into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. It was tied to him in case he died in the Holy of Holies. No one else was allowed to go in there. Otherwise, they too would die. So the rope was there to pull him out. This is what St. Paul is referring to in Hebrews. Now it's just the opposite case with Christ, his majesty. His priesthood opens up the gates of heaven. And by that rope that's tied onto him, he becomes an anchor. This rope is composed of the intertwining of faith, hope, and charity. And it's dyed red with his majesty's precious blood. We have an anchor a sure hold on entering into heaven, the real Holy of Holies. It is this very priesthood of Christ, the order of Melchizedek, that makes this possible. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us three basics about the order of Melchizedek as mentioned by St. Paul and its connection to his majesty. Namely, that the apostle says priest because he offered himself to God the Father. As St. Paul says in Ephesians, he loved us and hath delivered himself up for us as an oblation and a sacrifice to God. A sacrifice. Priests offer sacrifice. He offered himself. He goes on. And lest it be thought that the priesthood of Christ was the same as that of the old law, that of Aaron, he distinguishes it under two aspects. First, in respect to its dignity. Because it is forever. Its victim has the virtue of leading us to life everlasting. It lasts forever. 
Secondly, in respect to its right, because animals were offered in the old law, here bread and wine is offered. And for this reason, he says, according to the order of Melchizedek. Thank you, St. Thomas. His majesty then is the priest. It is forever and it leads to everlasting life. He's our anchor. It opens to us this anchor, this door to heaven, this sure rope of salvation opens to us through the rite of bread and wine. To see this more clearly, let's return to Abraham sacrificing his son for a moment. In this foundational type or image, we find the order of Melchizedek represented on two levels. First, Abraham, the father, takes his only son by Sarah and offers him in sacrifice. Here we see a priesthood at work. Remember the gospel parable of the vineyard where we hear how God the Father finally sends his only son to the vineyard. All his prophets and messengers had been either killed or beaten. He finally sends his son who is killed. The father sacrificed his only son. But Isaac knew what he was getting into. At first, he asked his father about the victim. Seeing the wood and the fire, father, where's the victim? His father said, God will provide we know at some point that Isaac realized he was the victim at the top of the mountain, seen by his carrying the wood and allowing himself to be voluntarily bound upon it. He offered himself willingly. Likewise, in the gospel parable, the son knew what he was in store for him as he approached those keeping the vineyard. They had a track record. He knew what they were up to. He went to do what he saw his father doing. Doesn't our Lord say that? I must do what I see my father doing. Sacrifice. Both of these are images of how the son of God voluntarily offered himself as both priest and victim. In Trinitarian theology, we know each person of the Holy Trinity by what are called notions. There's five notions. We know the Father by three of them. The first is that he is inashable, fancy word, to mean he's not born. He has no origin. He has no genealogy. He is not generated. The Son is eternally begotten or generated from the Father. And the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. Both of them have a genealogy, not the Father. He cannot be known in this way. The same is true of Melchizedek as he is presented to us in divine revelation. It's not that he didn't have a genealogy. He was human, but it was silent about it so that this symbol could be fully represented and understood that he represents something higher, something not of this world, something eternal. Thus, St. Paul says of Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but likened unto the Son of God, continueth a priest forever. So it seems then, fatherhood in God has a share in the priesthood of Melchizedek. He who has no origin sacrifices his son by sending him into the world. The son has the same order in that he does what he sees the father doing. He sacrifices himself as both priest and victim, making it available to us through the rite of bread and wine, the Holy Mass. Now bear with me as I make one more theological point before we draw out some very important lessons from this meditation. St. Thomas Aquinas, he teaches us this. The more noble the effect, the greater its precedence in the intention of the agent. The more noble the effect, the greater its precedent in the intention of the agent. 
Quoting the fathers, St. John Fisher says, the priesthood is the noblest of all dignities entrusted to man. The priesthood, therefore, must go back to the earliest intentions of God. In other words, God must have had the priesthood in mind from the very beginning of his creation. That means sacrifice and victimhood have been a part of this creation from the very beginning. Thus, the apocalypse speaks of the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Now, let's focus on what this means for us today. Some very important lessons here that are very timely. First, if fatherhood and God and the order of Melchizedek are connected, then those in the priesthood, the priests, it is essential that they adhere to authority. It's absolutely essential they adhere to authority. There cannot be any independent priests. There cannot be any priests that are not chained up to the keys of Peter. They're not acting properly. Second of all, every faithful soul then needs to adhere to the priesthood. It's essential for their salvation. They will not make it to heaven without it. It's not optional. Is this not connected to why we call priests father? And the very vicar of Christ, the Pope, is called the Holy Father. This means given the priesthood crisis in our times, fatherhood problem is at the root. A fatherhood problem. This is at the root of the crisis. A lack of understanding of where the priesthood comes from. And just what it is. It seems clear to me that the error of Russia, spoken of by Our Lady at Fatima, is at the root of fatherhood problem, the error of Russia. The major error, the first error, the primary error. It is a priesthood problem. Namely, they're splitting away from the papal authority so long ago. The ancient book about the bones of Adam the cave of treasures, calls Melchizedek father of kings. Listen to this great book. It's a parallel history of the, it's a tradition of how the bones of Adam came down to make Golgotha, the place of the skull. They discuss things as they go along. Here's a couple of them. In that same year in which Abraham offered up his son as an offering, in that same year, Jerusalem was built. And the beginning of the building thereof was in this wise made. Melchizedek, having appeared and shown himself to men, the kings of the nations heard his history, and they gathered together and came unto him. Melchizedek is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, the very mount where the temple was later to be built. Then it lists the name of 12 kings. It says, these 12 kings gathered together, and came to Melchizedek, king of Salem, the priest of the Most High God. And when they saw his appearance and heard his words, they entreated him to go with them. They understood his dignity. And he said unto them, I am not able to go from this place to any other. And they took counsel together about building him a city and said to each other, Verily, he is the king of the whole earth and the father of all kings. And they built him a city and made Melchizedek to live in it. And Melchizedek called the name thereof Jerusalem. And when the king of the south heard of this, he came to him and saw his appearance and spake unto him and gave him offerings and gifts. And Melchizedek was held in honor by all. And he was called the father of kings. Again, this shows how the priesthood of that order of Melchizedek participates in the fatherhood of God and is over all temporal leaders. St. Paul says in Hebrews that Melchizedek is the king of justice and the king of peace. The world will never find peace, dearly beloved, until it returns to submitting to the spiritual authority established by God on earth. 
No peace will be found by those in spiritual authority, those having the order of Melchizedek, no matter what their rank, submitting to kings by kissing their feet or allowing them to rule over the church, as is happening now in China. It used to be when a priest was found to be guilty of something, the secular government could not rule in his case. He had to first be tried by the church, then defrocked and removed from the priesthood. Then they could try him and kill him. It's inverted. I just described to you several inversions. The kissing of feet of kings and leaders of the world by prelates. This is an inversion. And it will never bring true peace. Never. This brings us to the second lesson. God the Father gives us peace when God the Son satisfies justice and enables us to do the same. What was the first goal of Christ in offering Himself? To atone and make satisfaction to the Father for all the wrongs done to Him by fallen angels and sinful man. That was first on the list. I must satisfy justice. My Father has been treated unjustly, and I'm here to undo it. How many today want justice in their case for their family or their country? But what about justice for God? To find peace, we must first start with the Christ and his sacrifice to satisfy the justice owed to God, and he will grant the grace for peace. And that is why this Friday, with all its blood and gore, is called good. If we do not have the priest offering the son to the father in the rite of bread and wine, according to the order of Melchizedek at the Holy Mass, it will not be satisfied. And that means no one will have justice without the holy priesthood of Christ and the Holy Mass he established on Holy Thursday so long ago. The more we forget the justice owed to God, the more the world will continue to spiral out of control. No wonder then, Our Lady said at La Salette, how there will be a time in which there will hardly be found a priest to offer the stainless sacrifice. Number three, this also means that the Holy Mass is for all time. Even the angels needed the sacrifice. Thus, Abraham saw the day of his majesty. He saw something of the sacrifice and he rejoiced. He had tapped into the justice that God provided and all was satisfied and peace was found. He got back Isaac and a sacrifice was provided. The mass is the sacrifice of the father sending his son and the son returning the gift. So Calvary is the son doing the same as he sees the father doing. So how is the priest that is before you today, like Abraham, he offers the mass? How is the priest like Isaac, we might ask? He offers himself in union with Christ. He says, this is my body. Number four, in God's creation, we need to make sacrifice to show love. Charity is based on self-giving. Once we sacrifice, God comes and makes us his own, his instruments. Once we give way to God, he remakes us into fantastic instruments. Angels had to sacrifice their excellence on the first day to make it to heaven. And those who did not were damned. Eve had to sacrifice her independence and desire for special knowledge and ascendancy over Adam, her husband. She had to submit to Adam, her head in the garden, and she did not. Adam had to sacrifice Eve for God's commandment, and he failed. Abraham had to sacrifice Isaac to become our father in faith. The apostles had to sacrifice their false notions of the Messiah, and so on for all of us. True love is spelt sacrifice. The problems in our world at root are a fatherhood problem. 
and a priesthood problem because there is an unwillingness to submit to the Father and do what he did, make sacrifice. Sacrificing the excellence we may think we have or do have and letting God remake us. Thus, there are a number of faulty attempts to remake God the Father to be something other than who he is. And here are a few. For the Jews, for the Jewish people, the fatherhood of God only requires external sacrifices that in the old law were merely symbolic. No sacrifices of the self are required. Thus, they crucified our Lord. For the Muslims, no sacrifice required for God the Father at all. That would be weakness. The only thing to be sacrificed are those who are not believers in God as they understand him. For New Agers, people make up some God that will allow them to remain sinful and keep to their own ideas. For example, the pianist Arthur Rubinstein was asked if he believed in God, and he said, no, I don't believe in God. I believe in something greater. He made up his own God. For bad Christians, they either make God the Father some friendly and indulgent God who will understand their failures and not hold it against them, totally ignoring the need to make just satisfaction. Or he is so distant as not to care much what happens to them. These folks are not willing to sacrifice their ideas, their visions, their excellence, and end up troubling many. But I think you see the point. God has the priesthood of Melchizedek. It is forever. It's from the foundation of this creation. It leads to everlasting life. And he has given this priesthood to men. Let's not give way to the pressures being applied to us at this time to bring it down. It is the most noble of all dignities entrusted to men. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.